Today I bring a unique insight from C.S. Lewis, The Ten Ways Demons Can Influence Your Life. In his classic book, The Screwtape Letters, Lewis introduces us to Screwtape, an experienced demon who writes to his nephew Wormwood, teaching him how to manipulate human souls. Get ready, brothers and sisters in Christ, for a spiritual journey that could transform the way you see life. It's important to remember, when screw tape refers to the enemy, he's talking about God. After all, screw tape is a demon. With this in mind, let's explore profound truths about the spiritual life, understanding how the balance between flesh and spirit can shape our walk with God. You'll discover how suffering can be a bridge to God, what it truly means to have faith, a faith that goes beyond fleeting emotions, and how true pleasure doesn't come from material possessions, but from a deep connection with the Creator. Moreover, we will talk about the value of humility and the importance of living in the present, always with the goal of strengthening our faith. Remember what is written in Romans 8, 5, 6. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. By the end of this video you will have a new perspective on how to deepen your spiritual life and your relationship with God. And we'll offer the opportunity for a wonderful prayer. Hello, we are Soulful Devotions. If you're here, know that it's not by chance. God has a purpose for your life and we believe he has guided you to us. I have to ask if you enjoy our content, please like, subscribe, and share with your loved ones. Without further ado, let's begin the video. First, have you ever wondered why it sometimes seems like God is more present in difficult times, as if pain, in some way, is a bridge that brings us closer to Him? God truly loves us and uses our pain and suffering to draw us nearer to Him. Screwtape says something surprising. In God's efforts to have a soul permanently at his side, he relies more on difficult times, on valleys, than on peaks of happiness. Some of his favorites have faced valleys far deeper than anyone else. The reason is that, for us, a human is like food. We want to absorb their will and increase our power at their expense. But what God seeks is different. He wants beings who, of their own free will, become like him, not because he has overpowered them, but because they have chosen it. We want cattle to become food. He wants servants who become sons. We are empty and want to be filled. He is full and overflows. This reflection from screw tape reveals something profound about God's love and the purpose of suffering. In his infinite wisdom and love, God uses the most difficult moments of our lives to shape us and bring us closer to Him. It is in these phases of pain and suffering, in the valleys, that God works most closely, shaping our souls like a careful craftsman. As it says in Romans 5, 3, 4, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character hope. It may seem contradictory, but it is in times of struggle that God is most present, working in our lives in a more intimate way. He doesn't just want us to be obedient. He wants us to grow and become His children, reflecting His image through those difficult moments. The challenges we face are not meant to break us, but to transform us into something greater. Think of how a sculptor works with a block of marble. He needs to use force and precision to carve out each detail. In the same way, God molds us through difficulties, preparing us for something greater. And you, 
Have you ever gone through a difficult time and later realized that you came out stronger and closer to God? It could be that God was closer than you thought. Second, we are spiritual beings living in human bodies. Think of it this way. We live between two worlds. One is the spiritual, which is unchanging, and the other is the physical, where everything is always changing. As human beings, we are always moving between these two worlds. Screwtape writes, humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. As spirits, they belong to the eternal world, but as animals, they inhabit time. This means that while their spirit can be directed towards an eternal object, their bodies, passions and imaginations are in constant change. To be in time means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy, therefore, is undulation, the repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall, a series of troughs and peaks. This description helps us understand our daily reality. We are constantly oscillating between what is eternal, our spirit, and what is temporary, our desires and emotions. And 2 Corinthians 4.18 warns us, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Screwtape points out that, as humans, we are always changing, living a journey of highs and lows, a sequence of moments of spiritual clarity and times of confusion. Have you ever noticed how one day you can feel spiritually strong but soon after you are pulled down by the worries of the day. This is our struggle. We are constantly trying to balance the spiritual and the physical, seeking constancy in the midst of change. The true journey is learning to focus on what is eternal, even when we are caught in the waves of emotions and desires. It's like a spiritual roller coaster a cycle of highs and lows that we all face on our walk towards the divine. Third, based on 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. Often we may be tempted to confuse faith with how we feel, but this can lead us away from the true meaning of faith. Screwtape shows us that the enemy tries to distract us by making us focus on our feelings instead of concentrating on God. Screwtape writes, whenever they, the humans, are directing their attention towards the enemy God, we are defeated. But there are ways to prevent them from doing so. The simplest is to turn their gaze away from him towards themselves. Keep them watching their own minds and trying to produce feelings by the action of their own wills. When they meant to ask for charity, let them instead try to manufacture charitable feelings for themselves and not realize that this is what they are doing. When they meant to pray for courage, let them really be trying to feel brave. When they say they are praying for forgiveness, let them be trying to feel forgiven. Teach them to estimate the value of each prayer by their success in producing the desired feeling. Screwtape reveals a common trap, the temptation to measure our faith based on how we feel. He advises his tempters to make humans focus on their emotions instead of on God. It's easy to confuse faith with what we're feeling in the moment, thinking that prayers are only valid when we can feel something specific. Have you ever found yourself praying for courage, but deep down, trying to force the feeling of being brave, or asking for forgiveness but thinking you weren't forgiven because you didn't feel it. This is exactly what screw tape wants, for you to think that faith depends on feelings. But true faith goes beyond emotions. It's not about how we feel, but about our trust in God, even when we feel nothing. Living by faith is focusing on God even on days when we aren't inspired or emotional. Our faith should not waver according to our feelings, but should be anchored in the certainty 
that God is with us, no matter how we feel. Fourth, God is the source of all good, as it says in James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Screwtape writes, It is far more likely that you will make your man a sound drunkard by pressing him to drink, as a painkiller when he is dull and weary, than by encouraging him to use it as a means of merriment among friends when he is happy and expansive. Never forget that, when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy has produced at times, or in ways, or in degrees which he has forbidden. Screw tape reveals an important truth. God created all the pleasures and good things in our lives. However, the enemy tries to get us to misuse these pleasures, such as by indulging too much or seeking satisfaction at the wrong times. Have you ever wondered why something good, like eating, can become harmful when taken to excess? God gave us these pleasures to be enjoyed, but with moderation and purpose. When we overindulge or misuse them, they can pull us away from our true purpose. The challenge for us is to learn to use the pleasures that God has given us in a balanced way. We must recognize that these moments of joy are gifts from God meant to enrich our lives and draw us closer to Him. If we understand this, we will celebrate what is good without letting these things control us or distance us from God. Fifth, fear is a liar. How do we know this? In 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Screwtape writes, We want him to be in the maximum uncertainty, so that his mind will be filled with contradictory pictures of the future, every one of which arouses hope or fear. There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy God. He wants men to be concerned with what they do, our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. What screw tape is saying is that fear is a powerful tool to distract us from God. He wants us to be trapped thinking about the future, all the things that could go wrong. When we focus on the what if, we forget to live in the present and trust in God. Have you ever found yourself imagining the worst case scenario and it paralyzed you? Fear traps us in a web of thoughts, preventing us from acting and trusting in God's plan. We become anxious and insecure, always expecting disaster. But God calls us to live differently, as it says in Isaiah 41.10-1.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He wants us to focus on the present, on the actions and choices we can make now, trusting that he is in control of the future. While fear tells us to worry about what could happen, God asks us to live with faith, believing in his promises. Fear may seem real, but it's a lie that pulls us away from the truth, that God is always by our side, guiding our steps. When we trust in him, we find the peace that fear tries to steal. To overcome fear, we need to focus on the present, do what is right today, and leave the future in God's hands. Sixth, we cannot rightfully claim anything as our own. Have you ever stopped to think about how we get irritated when we feel like something has been denied to us? 
The anger we feel doesn't simply arise from facing a problem, but from believing that some right of ours has been taken away. Do we truly possess time, things, or even ourselves? Screwtape writes, Men are not angered by mere misfortune, but by misfortune conceived as injury. And the sense of injury depends on the feeling that a legitimate claim has been denied. The more claims on life, therefore, that your patient can be induced to make, the more often he will feel injured and, as a result, ill-tempered. You must zealously guard in his mind the curious assumption, My time is my own. Let him have the feeling that he starts each day as the lawful possessor of twenty-four hours. In Psalm 24, 1, we are told that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. How many times have you been irritated by losing time in traffic or in a long line? We feel like our time has been stolen, don't we? But is it really ours? Through the cunning voice of screw tape, we are led to reflect on this deep illusion of possession that entangles the human heart. It's not just the fact of facing a misfortune that angers us. It's when we feel that our right has been violated. This vulnerability in us stems from the belief that we have sovereignty over certain aspects of our lives, whether it be time, possessions, or even our own existence. This belief, so deeply rooted in our minds, opens the doors to discontentment, bitterness and conflict. Let me ask you, if time isn't ours, to whom does it belong? What do we do when the interruptions of everyday life disrupt our plans? The notion that my time is my own is a strategic trap that blinds us to the greater reality that we are part of something much larger, the human community and God's divine plan. By deceiving ourselves with this false sense of control, we become frustrated when inevitable interruptions occur. And thus, we are thrown into a cycle of complaints and disillusionment. However, there is a greater wisdom to be found here. By letting go of the false claim over our time and possessions, we are invited to see a more liberating truth, our mutual dependence and the grace that sustains every moment of our existence. When we release this illusion of control, we find something precious, the peace that comes from knowing we don't need to hold the reins of everything all the time. And this peace frees us from resentment, helping us live with more gratitude and openness to what God is doing in our lives. This change in perspective is not an invitation to nihilism or passivity, but rather an opportunity to see life with lightness. When we stop holding on to everything so tightly, we begin to live generously, recognizing that each day, each moment is a gift. And in this space of gratitude, we begin to experience divine generosity, the same generosity that teaches us to give with joy and participate more fully in communion with others and with the Creator. So what will you do with this truth? Will you keep fighting for control that was never yours? Or will you release that burden and trust in God, who sustains everything with His grace? By letting go of our illusory claims, we find true freedom, the freedom to love more fully, to give more generously, and to live with a heart at peace. Under this new light, the idea of possession ceases to be a burden and transforms into an opportunity to be stewards and servants, reflecting the boundless generosity of our Creator. Seventh, faith is not a means to an end, but an end in itself. As it says in Hebrews 11:6. and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
How many times have we found ourselves using our faith as a means to achieve something? Are we seeking God for who he is or only for what he can give us? Screwtape writes, when you make the world an end and faith a means, you have almost won your man and it makes very little difference what kind of worldly end he is pursuing provided that meetings, pamphlets, policies, movements, causes, and crusades matter more to him than prayers, sacraments, and charity, he is ours, and the more religious on those terms, the more securely ours. This observation leads us to reflect on a subtle but profound mistake that can infiltrate our spiritual journey, turning faith into a mere means to achieve goals. When we use it just to gain worldly success, it loses its deeper purpose, which is to connect us with God in an intimate and sincere relationship. Faith should not be a tool to achieve success in the world, but the very reason for our existence, a path towards the Creator. Imagine someone who goes to church every Sunday, participates in service groups, but does all of this only to be seen as a good person or to receive something in return? What is missing here? A true connection with God. In this case, faith becomes a means, not an end. This dangerous shift in focus where the world becomes the final goal and faith only a mechanism to achieve earthly goals reflects a spiritual emptiness. It's not that external actions don't matter. They are important, but they must come from a heart rooted in prayer, sacraments, and genuine charity. Otherwise, even the noblest efforts can become empty campaigns driven by the ego, and in the end, they distance us from God rather than bringing us closer to Him. Are we allowing meetings, causes, or movements to become more important than our communion with God? We must ask ourselves what lies at the center of our faith. True faith should bring us close to God, not be used for our own interests. When we use it as a means to achieve temporal success, it loses its transformative power the power that shapes us into the image of Christ and fills us with God's love and truth. So what is moving your faith today? Are you seeking God for what he can do for you or simply because he is worthy of being sought? When we stop using faith as a bargaining chip, we discover something much greater, a peace and joy that come from seeking God for who he is, not for what he can give us. By recentering our lives on true faith, the fruits of this pursuit, acts of love, justice and compassion, naturally emerge. They are not the goal, but the result of a soul. In communion with the divine, a living testimony that living by faith transforms us and glorifies God in all things. Eighth, the devil is subtle and cunning. As 1 Peter 5, 8 warns us, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Have you ever thought that evil could be right beside you without you even noticing? How the enemy can operate in the shadows, invisible to our eyes. Screwtape writes, our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in ignorance. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, he cannot believe in you. How many times have you heard someone joke about the devil? As if he were just a simple joke, this is part of the strategy. Screwtape's advice reveals a cunning plan of the forces of evil. To remain hidden, becoming a figure of mockery. The idea of demons in red tights, ridiculed by modern culture, helps divert our attention from a real threat. Evil is there, 
but we ignore it because it disguises itself as something absurd, something that doesn't seem to deserve our consideration. The enemy is cunning. He doesn't just try to deceive us through temptations, but also works to keep us blind to his own existence. If we believe the devil is just a figure of mockery, we will never see him as a real threat. This is the genius of the strategy, not to convince us directly that evil doesn't exist, but to make us laugh at it, as if it were a childish tale. Think about it. How many times have we dismissed the idea of something spiritual simply because we can't see or touch it? In an age of skepticism and blind faith in science, this tactic becomes even more effective. The devil doesn't need to prove he doesn't exist. He just needs to make us believe the idea is ridiculous. Now, imagine living your whole life believing that evil is a joke, only to discover the truth too late. What's at stake here is much greater than we think. This is not just an intellectual or theological matter. It's a deep spiritual issue that affects every one of us. Recognizing this subtlety is essential for us to prepare ourselves. The devil operates in the shadows, but that doesn't mean he doesn't exist. We need to be vigilant, armed with faith and wisdom, to see beyond appearances. The real battle takes place on an invisible field, a spiritual battlefield that requires discernment, prayer, and a strong connection with God. So it's time to look beyond appearances and face this spiritual reality. Are you ready to see what has always been before you, but that you've never wanted to see? Ninth, we are called to live in the present with an eye towards eternity. How many times do we worry so much about the future that we forget to live in the present? Are we missing something valuable by ignoring the now? Matthew 6.34 answers, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Screwtape writes, Humans live in time, but our enemy God destines them to eternity. He, therefore, would have them continually concerned either with eternity, which means being concerned with him, or with the present, either meditating on their eternal union with or separation from himself, or else obeying the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present pleasure. Our business is to get them away from the eternal and from the present. With this in view, we sometimes tempt a human, say a widow or a scholar, to live in the past but this is of limited value, for they have some real knowledge of the past, and it has a determinate nature, and to that extent resembles eternity. It is far better to make them live in the future. Biological necessity makes all their passions point in that direction already, so that thought about the future inflames hope and fear. Also, it is unknown to them, so that in making them think about it, we make them think of unrealities. In a word, the future is, of all things, the thing least like eternity. It is the most completely temporal part of time, for the past is frozen and no longer flows, and the present is all lit up with eternal rays. Hence the encouragement we have given to all those schemes of thought, such as creative evolution, scientific humanism or communism which fix men's affections on the future, on the very core of temporality. Hence, nearly all vices are rooted in the future. Gratitude looks to the past and love to the present. Fear, avarice, lust and ambition look ahead. How many times have we spent the day thinking about what could go wrong tomorrow while missing the small blessings God gives us today. Screwtape's strategy reveals a central human dilemma, the tension between living in the present and being consumed by worry about the future. 
God calls us to live in the here and now, with our hearts anchored in eternity, but we are often tempted to look ahead with fear or expectation, losing sight of the present. This counsel to focus on the present with an eye towards eternity doesn't mean ignoring the future, but it reminds us that our lives are deeper than temporal concerns. Every moment we live when given to God is infused with eternal significance. We are called to live deeply in the demands of our conscience, bearing the crosses God gives us, receiving the grace of each day, and giving thanks for the simple joys he offers. When we allow ourselves to be swept away by obsession with the future, whether dreaming of a paradise or fearing a disaster, we distance ourselves from the peace God offers in the present. And this distraction not only alienates us from God, but it also puts us in a constant state of anxiety, making it difficult to live in communion with him and feel his guidance. Think about it. When we worry about what will come, how many times do we end up violating God's commandments in the present? We think that by making concessions now, we can guarantee a better future. However, this is not true faith. True faith is not conditioned by our own schemes to achieve security or success. It's trusting completely in God's providence, living according to his commandments, regardless of the circumstances or immediate results. Living in the present with an eye towards eternity is navigating life with a heart anchored in God's love. It means responding to the call of duty, love and grace and seeing every moment as a divine gift. When we live the present with a heart focused on God, we discover a peace that the future can never give us. So how are you living today? Are you seeking peace in God now? Or are you just worrying about what lies ahead? The choice is yours, and God calls us to live the present with gratitude and trust in Him. Tenth, humbling ourselves leads to greater love for ourselves and for others. As it says in Philippians 2, 3, 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Have you ever thought that true humility can lead us to a deeper love for ourselves and for others? Screwtape writes, To anticipate the enemy's strategy, we must consider his aims. The enemy wants to bring the man to a state of mind in which he could design the best cathedral in the world and know it to be the best, and rejoice in the fact, without being any more or less glad at having done it than if it had been done by another. The enemy wants to kill their animal self-love as soon as possible, but it is his long-term policy, I fear to restore to them a new kind of self-love, a charity and gratitude for all, including themselves, when they have really learned to love their neighbours as themselves. They will then be permitted, I suppose, to love themselves as their neighbours, for we must never forget what is the most repellent and inexplicable trait in our enemy. He really loves the hairless bipeds he has created and always gives back to them with his right hand what he has taken away with his left. How often do we find ourselves comparing our achievements to those of others, feeling pride or envy? What if instead we could rejoice in the victories of others as if they were our own? In this process we discover a profound principle. True humility does not diminish us, but opens us to a greater love. God's aim, as Screwtape reveals with disdain, is to bring us to a state of grace where our achievements are recognized and celebrated without making us proud. God wants us to see our accomplishments as part of something greater, where joy comes from the whole, not just from what is ours. This humility is not the end of who we are, 
but the liberation of our ego, allowing us to see and love others more deeply. When we let go of our pride and embrace humility, we are preparing ourselves for a different kind of self-love, a love that reflects God's selfless love. This new love is marked by charity and gratitude, not only for ourselves but for everyone, recognizing the divine image in each person. Loving your neighbor as yourself is not about diminishing your worth, but elevating the value of everyone around you. When we embrace this humility, something surprising happens. We discover that nothing we give to God is truly lost. When we sacrifice our pride and selfish self-love, God returns it all, transformed into deeper and more expansive love, a love that makes no distinction between loving ourselves and loving others. He invites us to love as he loves, abundantly and without limits. So what will you choose today? Will you continue seeking personal recognition? Or will you embrace humility, allowing God's love to flow through you to others? By saying yes to humility, you open the doors to a love that knows no end, that is not hindered by pride or fear. And in this love, we discover ourselves and our deepest connection to the world around us. At the end of this journey through C.S. Lewis's Ten Reflections as spoken through screw tape, I hope you have found more than knowledge, a new perspective on your spiritual life. Each lesson has challenged us to grow in love, humility and faith, confronting the distractions and traps we all face. May these reflections inspire you to live with more purpose and peace, with your eyes fixed on eternity. May humility not be a burden, but a path to a deeper love for yourself, for others, and for God. Now, I'd like to lead a prayer. I don't like to end a video without a moment of conversation with God. Heavenly Father, in this moment we turn to you, seeking your wisdom and grace. We know that the enemy uses many ways to try to lead us astray, but we thank you, because in you, we find the truth that sets us free. We ask now that you illuminate our minds and hearts so that we can recognize and resist the snares that surround us. Lord, help us keep our eyes fixed on you, understanding that our lives must be lived in the present without being consumed by fear or worries about the future. May we find peace in trusting your providence knowing that you are the God who cares for us in every moment. Grant us, Lord, a humble heart so that we may recognize our limitations and live with gratitude for what we have, without being caught up in pride or the desire for misguided possession. Teach us to love ourselves and others with the love that comes from you, a love that is not based on comparisons, but on charity and grace. Father, may we live with true faith, a faith that is not shaken by the emotions of the moment, but trusts in your goodness at all times. Even in suffering, may we draw near to you, knowing that you use all things for our good, shaping our character and drawing us closer to your heart. Deliver us from the temptation to seek pleasure in the things of this world and help us find the true joy that can only be found in your presence. May the pleasure we seek be that of living in communion with you, experiencing the peace that surpasses all understanding. Guide us, Lord, to live not for personal recognition, but for your glory. May we see our achievements as part of a greater whole and rejoice as much in the victories of others as in our own, knowing that all things come from your hands. Father, help us remember that the spiritual battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the forces of evil that seek to distance us from you. Give us discernment to identify the enemy's subtleties and strength to resist every temptation. May we always choose life in the spirit, as your word says, knowing that the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. 
Finally, Lord, may humility and faith be the marks of our lives. May we live in the present, trusting in you for the future, and may our journey be guided by your love and grace. In everything, we place our lives in your hands, knowing that only in you do we find true peace, joy and purpose. We thank you for guiding and protecting us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe you have been greatly blessed today, so please show your joy by helping us spread this valuable knowledge right here. By liking, subscribing and sharing our videos, you help us fulfill what is written in Mark 16, 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Together, we can change lives worldwide with this kind of content, and I believe in a better world with God in first place. Thank you for watching this video until the end and for praying with us. We are always happy to be part of your daily life, and may God continue to bless each of you and your families. See you in the next video.